Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. This is Trish Glose with News 10. And this is Vicki Aldis with the Mail Tribune. This is a little look behind the scenes into a special project that uh, we have just sort of wrapped up called Waiting for Tragedy. Uh, this is a partnership that KTVL News 10 has done with the Mail Tribune. I don't know if, if there's anything else really to add to that. We just sort of wanted to partner together and, and get something done. Mm -hmm. It As soon as we started our research, it became clear that people who were really frustrated by these mental health issues thought of it as a bigger bigger picture. And so the reach of the Mail Tribune and the television together, I think, can reach a broader audience and help people become informed about this pretty serious issue. For sure. And I guess we should probably talk a little bit about why we even decided to go with mental health, if you wanted to tackle that first. Yeah, there was a pretty disturbing case, and this was in August, in which a young man, his name is Pedro Sabasa Mendez, uh, was found guilty of murder except for insanity. And he murdered another young man named Avi Feldman, and this was in Ashland at a house party attended by teenagers and young adults. And we found out from the prosecutors and defense that Pedro Sabalsa's mother had tried to have him civilly committed before the murder, but Oregon's civil commitments, commitment standards are so incredibly high mm -hmm. that Almost everybody fails when they try this process. And then, of course, he did go on to murder another person. Right. And I think in one of our first meetings when we were sort of talking about why mental health, um, you know, you had that example as a, as a case, one example of this, the civil commitment. And then there was just another and another and another about these families essentially having such a hard time getting their loved one committed or just even finding help. Yes, it was really heartbreaking for all the families. Um, obviously, Michael Feldman, who is Avi Feldman's father, um, the father of the murder victim, the absolute worst consequence for him and his family. But on the other side, the young men, especially who are suffering from mental health problems, their parents try, have tried for yeah. years to try to get them committed, despite terrible things happening. There's a case of a man who served in the U.S. Air Force for 10 years. He was honorably discharged, and then he developed bipolar, and he was sleeping under a train, was dragged by the train down the tracks, injured mm -hmm. his ribs. He uh, hurt his ankle and his leg, broke it in a fall off of a bridge, wasn't found for two days, checked himself out of the hospital with the leg still broken, right. unhealed, and set off out on a cr cross-country trip, and his mother could not get him committed. And it just, you know, and, and as we sort of did our research, these stories just started coming out of the woodwork, mm -hmm. a lot of these. Um, and so kind of to go back to why we decided to partner News 10 and the Mail Tribune, um, I think you said it really nicely. We just, it's such a huge issue. We both brought different things to the table. Mm -hmm. So I think that was really interesting as far as, um, you know, it, it was my a first experience for me to work with a newspaper writer. And you guys are incredibly thorough and extensive. And um, I think TV side maybe offers up a little bit more emotion, but not really because it's so visual. But I think it was really an interesting experience to work with um, the paper, because it is such a huge issue, and we tackled it um, from all sides. Exactly. And as from the newspaper side, we have always, of course, done print stories and online stories. Mm -hmm. And of course, in recent years, newspapers have branched out into video, but we are not as far along as you. So it was a great partnership to work together on videos. Sometimes we shot our own videos. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you shot the videos. And when then we would swap the footage and share in the research on the story, which was great collaboration. Yeah, I think that was uh, a really interesting part, uh, because a lot of these interviews... Vicky and I scheduled together and we sat down together to ask all of the questions um, together. And so it was really interesting to get both sides of that as far as the questions that I would ask and the questions that you would ask. And we sort of, you know, push those together really to create our own stories, which can kind of bring us to this, this next point that we didn't write the stories together, but the interviews were definite, a team effort. 
Yeah, definitely we went our own direction and did a lot of our own original research. So there is a little bit of overlap, mm -hmm. but I think viewers who watch KTVL are going to see something completely different than what they see on in the Mail Tribune, both with our online videos and in, in our print articles. Right. And I'm excited too, um, as far as the, the Mail Tribune stories, to see those sidebars that you've been working on, just sort of like the side pieces next to the big piece. That's something that's very exciting to read about. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I appreciated is that anytime you do deal with mental health, we ran into many roadblocks because of mm -hmm. privacy issues. It's hard for medical professionals to talk about the cases individually. They can talk about the patterns that they see. We were denied twice on public records requests and had to appeal both of those denials to the Jackson County District Attorney's Office. So the fact that we could have a team effort yeah. going after this information, which is extraordinarily different, to, difficult to find. Right. I think we both found out that. So the fact that you were able to get some interviews, I was able to get some interviews, and then we could put it together, it just made this whole series doable. I agree. Do you think it also, because maybe a strong front from the media side, you know, you have a TV station who also has an online website, then you have the paper, the biggest paper in this region, and also an online website, kind of two forces coming at it. So maybe the interviews we were scheduling were a little bit more willing to say like, hey, this is a big deal. You have two kind of media outlets tackling it together. I think that that did really help. Um, and I think that the people that we talked to did want to express their stories and they were appreciative that both sides, the TV side and the newspaper side, were interested in learning more um, in an in-depth way and then sharing what we had learned and what the, so many people shared with us. Yeah, I think we heard a lot from several interviews, um, you know, people saying, now what is this? What is this going to be? And, you know, we had to break it down. It's a four-part series, you know, in the paper, online, on TV, kind of tackling it. And I, I think we heard over and over again, thank you so much for doing this because it's such a huge issue. We did, exactly. And I would like to put a word out of thanks to all the parents who participated because yeah. we could not have done this without their participation. And it, these are very, very difficult and painful topics for them to talk about. And it's hard for them to go in front of a camera. And yet yeah. they were willing to come forward and speak out. So I just have so much respect and gratitude to the parents who took part in the series. I also talked to a young man who has a bipolar disorder and schizoaffective disorder, and he described to me everything that he goes through every day. He said he can manage his symptoms, but it's like trying to push a rock up a hill every day. And if you could just imagine going through your daily life and you see, for example, an eyeball, a bloodshot eyeball, just sitting there with all these fingers picking at it. And he sees those kind of things on a daily basis. He just has to tell himself, there's a majority chance that that's not real. I can't panic. I just have to go through my day. And that was just mm -hmm. so startling to me. I just, you know, daily life is hard for everybody. But if you could imagine having to hear voices, see things. Right and wonder, is it real all day long? And I think um, we can all relate to this experience because there's such a fine line between the quote normal person and the mentally ill person. For example, we all dream every night and that seems normal, but they are basically dreaming while awake. Mm -hmm. So I hope people can put themselves in, in, the, in the shoes of people who are mentally ill and think, what would that be like for me if I was awake and yet I was experiencing the same kind of emotions and sensations as I do when I'm safely tucked away in bed under the covers? Nothing bad can happen to me. I'm not acting on what I'm seeing. Right. What if that was going on in your waking life? Yeah, and that's, that's a very good example and kind of hard to imagine. Um, do you think it was difficult at all just based on the topic it's, itself? I feel like mental health is sticky. It's something that most of us don't really want to talk about. Um, going into it, I felt a little bit more comfortable with certain interviews, kind of diving into the topic of mental health. But I think in the very beginning, it's you don't want to say the wrong thing. You don't want to ask the wrong question, I guess. Yeah, I think that um, it was hard. Um, that's a balancing act. Like when we had to go and interview Michael Feldman, who is mm -hmm. the father of the murder victim, that was very difficult. And yeah. we had to ask him some very, very hard questions. And he was very brave 
in going ahead and answering everything that he had gone through and what his son had gone through. So it was a difficult process for them. Yeah, that was a very, uh, very difficult interview. And just, you know, for the listeners to give you a little background, we interviewed him on Halloween. And um, a year ago, this Halloween, he actually spent the entire day with his son, Avi. And he, um, in the interview, he said it was the last best day ever. They went to the parade. They went out to, to eat. Um, they came back to uh, Michael's house. And I think later they went to go play pool. And so he just had this really great day with him. And I remember asking him, do you think that was some sort of like a goodbye, you know, kind of like a, I don't know, on some sort of higher level, higher power, his goodbye to his son. And he said, no, because we had lots of good days like that. So he didn't even really think twice about it. But it was very interesting that the day Vicki and I interviewed Michael Feldman, it was a year. Um, that was really the last time he hung out with his kid, with Avi. Exactly. And the aftermath, of course, it continues mm -hmm. to affect him. Um, he doesn't really display photos of his son around the house because for now, at least it's too hard for him to see that. So he doesn't have his son in the house anymore. He doesn't see photos of his son. And Avi Feldman's little sister, who's now a teenager, it was so traumatic for her that she had to be sent away to a therapeutic boarding school. So Michael Feldman doesn't have either of his kids in the house. And that is just, you know, devastating well, for, if, for any parent. Yeah. And if you remember, because Avi was murdered, it was November 6th, 6th yes. uh, 2016. So, um, you know, just over a year ago. And so he said at the time, you know, it was incredibly shocking for him, but he had this distraction of moving into a new house. So he really spent two weeks moving into a new house after his son is murdered. And I think after the holidays, he said it hit him like a brick wall. It just hit him. And then it continued for months after that. So he, not that he took a break from dealing with it, but it really did he had a very long grieving process that I think most people deal with it right then and there. And he said he just couldn't because he had this distraction of moving into a new house and it was so stressful. And then all of a sudden it just hit him like a ton of bricks. Yeah, it's been very difficult. And then when you add in the fact that there's an ongoing criminal case that didn't wrap up until just this August, mm -hmm. he uh, came in August to Pedro Sabalsa Mendez's sentencing hearing. Pedro Sabalsa Mendez, by the way, is in custody at the Oregon State Hospital as a murderer, um, it's really sad because his mom wanted him to be committed. She wanted him to be in a mental institution, and that's where he is, except he's not a young man with the onset of schizophrenia who's somewhere getting treatment to try to get stabilized for this really devastating disease. He's in Oregon State Hospital with schizophrenia and is now a, a convicted murderer. Right. And she tried multiple times, right? She reached out to the police, and she. Um, the problem with civil commitment is when parents try to do it and they consult with a county mental health worker, they get told pretty quickly here are the state standards, and unless it's an extreme situation, virtually nobody qualifies. Wow. Um, hardly any of the investigations even go forward to a judge. In the Pedro Sabalsa Mendez case, he didn't go before a judge for the judge to determine whether he should be committed to a mental institution. There's basically kind of a gatekeeping process at the county level everywhere in the state where people are told, I'm sorry, but your young person or whatever age they are, they just don't meet the standards because Oregon has some of the strictest standards in the entire nation. I um, There's Judge Wolke, who is in Josephine County, is head of a task force that's looking at civil commitment standards. He's researched the standards in all 50 states, and people can be committed in other states for verbal threats. That's not something that's allowed in Oregon. Right. They can be committed for destroying property, also not allowed, not cannot be considered in Oregon. Another thing is the judges in other states can take in account the person's history, their pattern of behavior. And judges here are only looking at how does this person look right now at our hearing. And we're talking about a population of people who are the mentally ill with schizophrenia and bipolar. They're, they're intelligent. They can put up a front briefly 
and fake it, as we've learned from so many experts. So yeah. they get out of the hearing. The judge thinks the person looks fine, no immediate danger. They get released on the streets and in some cases go on to commit crimes the very same day that they are released from the local hospital bed. And the Pedro Avi case, um, they were at a party and, you know, uh, Michael Feldman told us that Pedro essentially told Avi he was hungry and Avi said, well, I'm going to this party. I'll go get you some food. So he's trying to help Pedro out, essentially, um, which was, according to his dad, that's just the kind of kid he, he was. So it's just incredibly sad that, you know, he was reaching out to this other person that he knew was having problems, too. And this ended up happening to him at a party. Um, one thing that Michael Feldman said about it was the really emotional part of the interview. I'm sure you remember when we asked him, what does he miss about Avi, about his son? And he said, name it, everything. You asked if I worried about him. Sometimes my phone would ring and I would think, uh-oh, what does he need now? You try to have that tough love with your kids. And he kind of broke down and started crying and said, what I wouldn't do to get a troublesome call again. I miss his hugs. I miss his smell, his smile, his energy, his rap. He used to love to freestyle rap, and he was a great, great dancer. Just that was probably easily the most emotional part of the interview with Michael Feldman. That was very difficult. Yeah, yes, it was brutal. What uh, what stuck out to you in doing all of the the research and and the interviews for this story? Well, the thing that surprised me quickly is when we first started the series, I thought we were looking at an isolated example. Mm -hmm. Pedro Sabalsa Mendez's mother tries to get him mental health care and treatment and intervention. Something breaks down in the system. Someone does something wrong. What we found out is that this is common. Mm -hmm. People are not successful at trying to get somebody civilly committed in Oregon because of the extremely high standards. So this is not an aberration. This is something that could happen tomorrow. In fact, we talked to Laura Cromwell with the district attorney's office, and she handles many of the mental health cases. She also advises Jackson County mental health workers whether she thinks that someone meets the standard for commitment and whether they should proceed with a commitment hearing before a judge. She said that after this Pedro case, it's always in the back of her mind, oh, no, um, what if I give advice? This person doesn't meet the standard, so we shouldn't proceed forward with a commitment hearing, and then that person is released. What if that person goes out and does something terrible? Right. But what's the alternative? She recommends that they get committed. It doesn't meet the standards. She's violating their civil rights. And Jackson County Mental Health would be violating the person's civil rights. The case goes before the Oregon Court of Appeals and it gets turned down um, and found to have been an illegal infringement on the person's civil rights. And another thing that we learned in researching the, si the series is not that just that the civil commitment standards are so high, but there was a nationwide effort to deinstitutionalize the mentally ill um, and it was a good thing to do because they were being warehoused. There were some right. really bad practices. Well, the um, Oregon State Hospital, I'll check my numbers here, um, they had more than 3,500 patients in the Oregon State Hospital. Those were people at the highest level of care receiving psychiatric services. Nowadays, the Oregon State Hospital has only 678 beds. And one of the saddest things is only one-third of those beds, actually less than a third, are occupied by people who have been committed to the mental institution. The other two thirds of those 658 beds are occupied by people who are involved in the criminal justice system. Those are people who already have been judged guilty except for insanity and people who need mental health stabilization so that they can aid and assist their defense attorneys in their own case. So there's an extreme shortage of psychiatric beds at the state level, and that is playing out at all levels right. when you go down to the local hospitals who have to try to do anything they can to find a safe place for people at the local level. And Laurel, uh, Laurel was telling us it's not just our community, nine counties, and she kind of broke it down, 600,000 people that the Behavioral Health Unit serves at Asante. So 18 beds, soon to be 24 for 600,000 people. Now, granted, not all of those people have mental health issues, but a lot of them do, and there's no place for them to go. Yes, and I think one of the saddest things that we saw there is 
there are holding rooms in the emergency department. And because Rogue Regional Medical Center can't accept mm-hmm. child psychiatric patients, those child patients who in some cases are on the verge of suicide, those children have to wait for beds to open up in the Por- a Portland Psychiatric Hospital that accepts kids. And sometimes they spend days waiting in these little rooms um, in the emergency room as little kids with nothing there. I mean, there's a padded couch. There's a recliner for a parent to wait with them. Right. There's a TV mounted high up on the wall, but they're just confined there day after day while they wait for a bed to open up in Portland. And, the, and who knows how long they could be waiting. Um, and that's, you know, Laurel was telling us when she started in mental health, the daily census, the, the daily, you know, who was in these beds was anywhere from 12 to 14. And now there's a waiting list or, you know, you just, you have to hold them somewhere else until a bed opens up and you never know when that's going to be. Exactly. So local people who experience a mental health crisis, if the beds, the few beds at the psychiatric unit in Medford, if those are all filled up, they might get shipped out to Coos Bay. They might get ship to any corner of the state, far away from their friends, their family, any mental health workers who have been helping them along the way. So they are separated from their support network. And everybody, mental health workers, doctors, everybody says separating them from their support network, the people that they know, the people that they trust is the worst thing that you can do. Yeah. Uh, We also talked to uh, Judge Lisa Greif, kind of the solution sort of part of it. Um, she runs mental health court for Jackson County. And I think the coolest, I think Judge Greif is pretty awesome just alone. But um, there's all these community members that come together on mental health court days for these. You have to have pending charges in Jackson County to be able to be considered for mental health court. Um, but you have all these players coming to the table essentially to help these people find housing or education or a job and really turning their lives around. They're not getting paid any extra money for this. This is just out of the kindness of their heart. Lisa actually said it's just the right thing to do. It's just the right thing to do for us to take care of these people who a normal court system does not work for them. They cannot handle, it's not appropriate for them to be in a traditional court setting. So mental health court kind of helps them figure things out and get get back to their own lives. And they've had so many successes with these people who are in mental health court, so many graduations. So I think that's, while they're doing what they can, little by little, that is kind of the silver lining for, you know, the mental health care crisis that you have all of these key players in the community that are really trying to make a difference for these people. And it is that team approach that really helps Mm -hmm. people with mental illness. The man who I talked to who told me about his delusion or his hallucination where he saw the eyeball with all the fingers poking at it, he said that in the past he, he didn't want to talk about his problems because he felt like that would just make it worse. By airing it, that would just validate what was happening to him and almost make it true. But because he has such a level of trust in all the professionals who are surrounding him with the mental health court in Jackson County, he says that he feels he will follow through with the things that they recommend for him because he knows that they have the best interests of him in mind. He said in California, um, I mean, I know we've been knocking Oregon a lot for its high civil commitment (laughs) standards, but um, he said that when he was in California, he didn't think the mental health workers there really cared for him. He did spend time in an institution. He said it felt like he was in a factory. But in Jackson County, he said that people aren't just doing a job. They are there because they care every day. Right. Um, I don't know if you remember the nurse in the psychiatric care unit at Asante. I was chatting with him for a long time while you guys were asking questions and getting video and he's been a nurse since the seventies and he's done everything. He's worked in the emergency room. He's um, been on an air flight and and done that. And he said, if he knew the rewards he uh, would be getting from the mental health side of things, he would have gone into mental health a long time ago. And he had this great story about, he went to go get gas and the gas station attendant comes over to him and says, you work in the psychiatric care unit. And the nurse was like, I I do actually. And he goes, do you remember me? We basically had a struggle in the psychiatric care unit and um, you really helped me. And, you know, the nurse obviously was taken aback and and the gas station attendant said, and now I have this job. I got married. I'm taking care of my kids. And um, 
and life is pretty good. And the nurse told me, he said, that was just the best reward, absolutely priceless, that even it was just one story for him, what a huge impact it made for him. And that he just said, this is where I want to continue working. This is where I can do the most good in the mental health care unit. So it's just a really nice story, I think. And again, it's that silver lining to a very scary topic. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We did find out that there is a lot of reason to have hope. Absolutely. Um, so you've been listening to a little behind the scenes, uh, waiting for tragedy. Once again, this is Trish Gloss with News 10. And this is Vicki Aldis with the Mail Tribune. And we would love for you to check out our stories. Uh, you can go to ktvl.com and uh, click on the links for Waiting for Tragedy. There's a series of stories there for you. And we are at mailtribune.com.